The following interview was conducted with Brian Lamb, executive chairman of the board of C-SPAN for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, April 11, 2013 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of Library Science. All city, also sitting in is his wife, Victoria. Brian, welcome. This is a follow-up to an interview that we conducted, I conducted with you in 06, and you're currently serving as the executive chairman of the board of C-SPAN and for our researchers, Cable Satellite Public Affairs Network. Let's talk a little bit about C-SPAN 1, 2, and 3. It started with C-SPAN 1. C-SPAN 1 has been in uh, business since 1979. It's the primary network. We have our call-in show every day from 7 a.m. until 10 o'clock, seven days a week. And it was the first and almost the only national television call-in show. Uh, it doesn't work for commercial institutions, and so they don't do it. The uh, Network 1 carries the House of Representatives whenever it's in session and lots of other things around it. Network 2 was started in 1986, mm -hmm. and that is pr the primary uh, network for the United States Senate whenever it's in session. And then we also surround that with books on the weekends. There's 20, 48 hours of books <clears throat> on uh, Saturday and Sunday. And Network 3 was started in 1999, and I'm not absolutely positive about that, but <clears throat> it was actually meant to be just another place to put public affairs programming that wasn't uh, controlled by either the House and Senate whenever they're in session. And we added that uh, as an extra. And if you subscribe to C-SPAN 1, you get the other two for no extra charge. Okay. What, uh, for researchers, when the House and Senate is not in session, uh, you still are, are filming? Correct. Well, not only that, but okay. when the House and Senate uh, are not in session, it's really the the most of our programming. We uh, we do about 15 percent of our programming a year is the House and Senate. The rest of it is about books. It's about history. Okay. It's the hearings. We have over 2,000 hours a year of hearings. And main events that go on in Washington and around the country, all the governors, state of the states speeches are on there. For instance, the current President of Purdue University, Mitch Daniels, has eight of those state of the states that are on in our archive. Oh, very good. Quite, quite wide and varied and diverse. Then. Yes. Um, Book Notes was something that was started in 1989 and ran till 2004. So, and I understand you've now given that to the special collections at George Mason University. Tell us a little bit about the Book Notes. And Book Notes was a program I did once a week, and I would I had a couple of rules that I set up for myself. One is that a guest could only be on once. It had to be a hardback book, and it had to be nonfiction. Uh, and I always read the book. That was part of it. I, this was a pact that I made with myself. <clears throat> and the idea was that so many authors appear on television, and the people that are interviewing them never have read the book. So I did that for 801 interviews. And, uh, That's a nice I, round number. <laughs> yes, it is. I, we always do that. You know, our programs are 57 minutes long, and they start at six minutes after the hour. I like hour those numbers. <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. I uh, gave it up, actually, after 16 years because I just was tired of having to do the weekly book, and I read them. And it was time to kind of change the format, and so we started something called Q&A. And that started in December of 2004 and has been mm -hmm. going on Sunday nights ever since. Okay. On the selection of the books for book notes, did, uh, how did, did you select the authors, and is that how the selection of the people? I had to say yes. Okay. Uh, I often said no, and it was based on a rhythm that I felt for people who watched, and a lot of people watched, that, that, and it wasn't an enormous audience, but those that did watch, watched every Sunday. And so they were used to a pattern of books, and you wanted to make sure that you didn't bore them, you didn't keep being repetitive, and you covered a wide area of subjects. Okay. Um, so tell us about the staff of uh, C-SPAN, how it's grown, and what are some of the responsibilities, and are, are they on site and for the researchers? We have 280 people on site as of right now. Uh, actually, 10 of those are based here in West Lafayette at the Purdue uh, Research Park, where we have our archive located, and the rest of them are at C-SPAN in Washington block from the United States Senate. We started with four and we moved up systematically as our networks got bigger and longer in, in uh, the day. I mean, we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And most of our people are generalists. They often graduate in political science, communications, history. There are very few engineers. We do have 11 engineers on staff. And those, some of them don't even have college degrees. They're incredibly bright, but they are our engineering group. And we've had people that came to us over 30 years ago and they've stayed. Mm -hmm. And they're now vice presidents. And those vice presidents were responsible for building the network in their eyes and uh, from their vantage point, which has made it really fun to watch over the last uh, 35 years. Right. And you have some sort of an intern program too, don't you? Oh yeah, we have, we've had have 1,500 to 2,000 interns over the year. We usually have about 15 to 20 a semester and then in the summer. And we're now lately getting a lot more from Purdue. We're trying hard to get more Purdue students involved. Good. That's very good. Uh, a little bit about the equipment and uh, how has that changed in, uh, over time? Equipment has changed dramatically. Okay. We've just gone through a $20 million rebuild. That sounds like a lot of money. It is to me. But in the television business, it's not much. We've switched from analog to digital. And we've switched from standard broadcasting, standard uh, definition to high definition. And all this has cost us a lot of money and time. And it's been, it's an arduous process. It's been going on at our place for about the last three years. Mm -hmm. It's not complete. We've had to buy all new cameras, all new switching gear, all new recording devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the audience, how has that changed over time? And if any change, has it grown or any comments on the audience for your program? We don't have ratings, so we okay. never know how many people's watching at any given quarter hour. We do take surveys every four years after the election's over when people are the most attentive to what right. they've been watching. Our audience numbers have gone up. I'm not a great one for, for uh, promoting this because in the end it hasn't really mattered because no one has asked us who pays our bills what the size of our audience is. The best news we've gotten, and again, I am always suspicious of uh, any of these surveys, but they've come from highly trained people, is that our a younger audience is more aware of C-SPAN than they've ever been and say they're watching more than they ever have. I think it's primarily due to the fact that we're available on so many different platforms, on your smartphone, on your iPad. But more importantly than all that, we are used by John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and Saturday Night Live and all these different programs that which do documentaries, people are watching. which people are watching, and that advertises what we do to them. Right, exactly. Okay. Uh, your financial support uh, for researchers, what, uh, how, how does that come about? Every penny of our financial support comes from private industry. Okay. It comes from mainly two different sources, those cable television uh, systems around the country and the satellite to home industry that called Dish TV or Direct TV. Okay. But about 65% of that comes from the cable television industry. And the cable television industry started us. The board of directors of C-SPAN is made up of 21 people. All of them have to be CEOs or COOs of the cable television companies. And our budget uh, in this year, uh, 2013, will be about 62 million. Okay, all right. You mentioned a few moments ago about the archives. And for researchers, you want to tell a little bit about the archives and where uh, you said where it's located. The archives were originally a joint project between C-SPAN and Purdue. The two people most responsible for starting them were Sen uh, Senator, uh, Congre <laughs> I'm really off beam, uh, Professor Robert X. Browning, okay. and the former head of the political science department in the liberal arts school, David Caputo, who moved on to be the president of Hunter College in New York and also was president of Pace University. And then uh, several years ago, I can't remember the exact date, we separated from the university officially and C-SPAN pays for the entire archive, but it's still located here. Robert Browning runs it, he invented it, he was the genius behind it, uh, but we are the ones that totally finance it now. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, now the administration change, as I mentioned earlier, you've got two co-chief executives, um, Rob Kennedy and Susan Swain, who've been with you for quite a while. Rob Kennedy's been with us about 26 years. Susan Swain's been with us 32 years, uh, actually 31 as we're recording this in 2013. And Robert, uh, Rob Kennedy is a University of Illinois graduate, an MBA recipient from the University of Chicago. Susan Swain has a degree from the University of Scranton. And the two of them now are co-chief executive officers. 
they're the bosses. I stepped aside in March of 2012 and remain at the company, work every day, but uh, don't have the responsibility anymore of making the big decisions. Yeah, okay. Um, some future planning, anything that you care to comment on for the next five years or some thoughts? Um, one of the things that I did read it, that the, the federal government may be doing some stream or some of their projects or, or you want to comment on anything on any changes that may be coming down the pike? Our world has changed right. as much in the last five years as communications changed from the time we started back to the beginning. Uh, this digital high def world is moving very fast. The town of Washington was resistant to cameras for a lot of years. They didn't want them poking their nose into their business, even though they were public servants. And after 30 years of us being in business, they all of a sudden got religion and have started buying up cameras, putting their own cameras in all the hearing rooms, streaming on the web, the House of Representatives after 30 some years of us doing it, the same thing in the Senate. And then all the hearing rooms began to televised the hearings every day on the websites of the different committees. So we're finding that everything that we did for the last 30, 35 years is the government's taking taxpayer money and starting to do it It's come themselves. full circle. It's come full circle. Right, yeah. okay. A um, couple of the interviewing, uh, talk a little about your style and you, you I, well, I think we mentioned this in the previous one, but a lot of it goes back to your high school. That was one of your, Bill Frazier. That's where you got started. William. Sites Fraser Jr. He is dead, oh. uh, and he's. I say that's, un, you know, it's not, it's not fun to say that. He died when he was 80 years old. I was there and, and helped give the eulogy at his funeral. He's buried over here in Memory Gardens, and was my high school broadcasting teacher when I was 13 years old. And I started out learning broadcasting from him. He taught the basics. And thank goodness it was somebody like Bill Fraser who believed in the basics. Today, I'm not sure people believe in the basics. And he taught me that if you're interviewing, the important person in the interview is not the interviewer, it's the interviewee. And so he taught me how to listen. And more interviewers than not don't listen. Uh, the objective, if you're paid a lot of money, which at C-SPAN, that's not our object, our objective, the money part of it isn't, and we don't have ratings, and we don't have sponsors, and we don't have stars, that it takes on a whole different dynamic. And I'm not being critical of the others because they have not the same responsibility that we right. do, but we try to ask open questions, meaning that you don't put words in somebody's mouth by saying, you are a lousy interview, aren't, interviewer, aren't you? And the, where does the place person have to go? You're better off asking, what kind of an interview do you think you, interviewer do you think you are? And so we've always tried to keep our questions open and listen because people say some fascinating things. And if you don't follow up on it, the audience says, well, hey, how come you didn't ask the next question? You were too busy looking at your list of questions to realize that somebody just said something very interesting. Right, exactly. Um, do you do some, uh, the people that, you, uh, that you've interviewed, they come to the table somewhat prepared or some, or that is not always the case. I mention this because quite often I, I have sent um, the list of topics to them and, and I'm willing, and that's very good, not the questions. And they'll sometimes make little notes on that. So that helps them a little bit. I try to give them a head up, particularly some of them who may have been retired for a period of time and don't have some of their materials close at hand. So having that as a refresher helps. Most of the time that people that come to our interview sets have no idea where we're gonna go, except that they know they've been invited because they either wrote a book or they're, okay. they're gonna talk about their life or something that they're involved in. Uh, I've found over the years that people are most surprised by my personal questions. They don't know they're coming, they don't think they're coming, they're not used to them. And the personal questions aren't uh, underneath the skin kind of thing. It's the basic stuff about, and, and the question a lot of people like the answer to, what were your parents like? What did they do? What kind of influence did right. your mentor have? Who was your mentor? Uh, they're the simplest of questions. Sometimes- Key questions that mean a lot that'll bring depth and, and, and back to the, to the interview itself. Right, and sometimes they're not ready for it, but that's often the most fun. That's right, I agree. <laughs> a couple of the on-campus interviews that you've done, um, one of the ones I think was for that uh, 
global university convocation. Uh, with, with President Carter, I want to make a couple comments on that one. And then also, Dr. Luger, were you here for the energy one? No. no. Okay. I was not here for Dr. Luger. Uh, the, the Global Initiative uh, Conference was set up in conjunction with the inauguration of President Cordova. And uh, I came out, my role was insignificant in it, except that uh, I met a lot of interesting people. and. Um, uh, Renu Couture, who is the chancellor of the University of Houston, was on the panel, and she is an Indian woman from the country of India. And as a result of being on that panel, I asked her later to come to the studio in Washington, and I did a profile interview with her, which was fantastic. I mean, she talked about how her parents had literally I don't know. I don't know that I should use the word force, but she was. Her marriage was all set up and preordained arranged. by the arranged, and her husband ended up coming here to teach. She ended up coming here and going to school and doing well, and then going off to be the chancellor of the University of Houston, which is phenomenal. Uh, and that she told her personal story. So I. That's my biggest memory from there. From that right. time, within the, in addition to the fact that uh, it was pre, uh, President Cordova's. Right. Inauguration. That's right. And you've also interviewed um, Mitch Daniels, our, the former governor and now the president of Purdue University. The first one was when uh, had to do with the book that he'd come out with, Keeping the Republic, Saving America by Trusting Americans, and then since he's become president. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to interview Mitch Daniels in several different worlds that he's lived in, as the director of the Office of Management and Budget, uh, as um, the governor of the state before all of this came about here at Purdue. Uh, and uh, it, it just was interesting that it led to him being, not, not my interviews, but it, his whole life led to him being the president of Purdue. When we all started uh, this conversation, which was 20, 25 years ago with him, I say we, when I had the uh, fortunate experience of interviewing, no one ever had any idea that he'd end up as the president. I have to say though, the last interview I did with him for the book, there was just an unspoken sense that it wouldn't be surprising if he ended up at Purdue. I can't tell you why he was in the, he had decided when he, the book came out that he was not going to run for president of the United mm -hmm. States. He was eminently qualified to run almost anything. Uh, and he agreed to stay out of politics and leave that behind him and to not be partisan in any way and then come to this university because of his real interest in education. Uh, I, it, it's just been fun watching that process, and I do have two interviews that I've done with him in and around this experience here, and they were very interesting. I learned a lot from him in his book. But more importantly, and this has been our goal in our involvement here, the students ask a lot of questions. Right. That's what really mattered to me. Right. Well, that brings us to that project impact, and I think researchers, I'd like for you to make some comments on that because that has really taken taken hold here, and you've been pretty much involved, quite involved in it, along with Professor Curiel. Professor Curiel uh, started Pr Project Impact about three years ago, and I don't. Uh, she first got interested in C-SPAN. Well, she came from the New York Times and the Washington Post, and she was an ambassador, and she wrote speeches for Bill Clinton. But she came to C-SPAN thanks to the archive. She first introduced herself to Robert Browning when she worked for France Cordova as her chief of staff, and then got more and more interested as she moved over to the communications department and started the idea of Project Impact. And when she came to me with this, it was made to order because I believe so strongly from my own experience at Purdue and the practical experience. It's great to go into the theory, but in the end, I think a college or a university ought to offer the opportunity for people to get involved in the practicality of whatever they're heading into. And so she was as interested in that as I am. And so even though I'm not a teacher, uh, I just got a, 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 a basic <clears throat> Bachelor of Arts degree here. Uh, the two of us clicked, and we now do a course via television. I, I'm, in, I'm in Washington. We bring guests into the studio. She's here. The students are here. And we have this interaction. Oh. Uh, is it offered both semesters? Uh. It's not offered every semester, although right now we're offering it. We offered it this last semester, and we're going to do it again in the fall. Oh, okay. Alrighty. Now, that brings us to the Brian Lamb School 
a communication approved by the board in April of 2011. Um, quite often with people who have gotten Sagamores, I often ask them how they heard about it. Sometimes it's a surprise. But do you want to share any comments on how that came about in, to you? It was or bizarre. For the researchers, because they'll say, wow. <laughs> it was bizarre. Um, I will first say to them, I didn't give the school of uh, Purdue University one dime for this, and I had never wanted my name on anything, let alone uh, my university. Uh, I, I was kind of su surprised beyond all belief the time that Dean Budweiser, head of the department Howard Cipher and Carolyn Curiel came to Washington and wanted to have lunch. And they said they had something they wanted to talk to me about. I had no idea what it was. And we had lunch at the Washington Court Hotel. And uh, after some niceties and ordering our food and all that, uh, my memory is that I think it was Howard Cipher who said, we have a proposal to make to you. And I really, my jaw dropped. And the funny thing about it is uh, my reaction was not, who, me? Uh, <clears throat> for a lot of different reasons, but the thing that I doubt if I'd have done it if um, if I would have been able to think about it. And Howard said, "We're not going to let you leave this table today until you give us an answer." Uh, and I don't know why. I mean, it's it's pretty crazy to have your name on a school. Uh, I I said yes. Uh, had misgivings since then. Uh, it's odd. It's just odd. That's all I'll tell you. If if I wanted it, I would have. I don't. I would have never gotten it. The fact that I got it and never wanted it is strange. And then seeing your name pop up all the time, it's it's been an un surreal experience. Yeah, it's very it's very nice. My good wishes. It's very nice. Now the um, you have an advisory board. Uh, could tell the researchers how that did. You, were you involved in any of the selection of the advisory board, and what is their role as far as the school is concerned? Carolyn Curiel is the one that put the advisory board together. She asked me to be on it, just like she asked Chris Morris and uh, Dale Popillo and Paula Dwyer uh, and Bill Moreau, and she is uh, pretty persuasive. Uh, that board has turned out to be our our. Our teachers, I mean, they come to the class and spend an hour and 15 minutes with our students from Washington most most of the time. And it's a tremendous thing to watch them educate the, uh, the young folks. And they, our objective in the class is that those young folks ask the questions, not us. Right. And it works. Right. Okay. Um, then you got recently got a gift. Two million in the university is putting associated for an anonymous donor. And I thought the press release was very good in how it's going to be allocated. I think that it's thought, well thought out. That anonymous donor is from the cable television industry. Uh, he just doesn't want, he doesn't care whether people know who he is. He's a tremendous uh, public servant in many, many ways, involved in public broadcasting and children's television workshop and C-SPAN board of directors and has retired a number of years ago. And I think I'm as surprised as anybody that he gave money, not because <clears throat> he wouldn't do it, but I never asked him to do it. And uh, he was the first one to step up. And we got it allocated in a way that, in the end, one of the primary recipients are the students and the scholarships. Right. And that was key to the whole thing. Right, that's very good. And that for um, I just want to make a comment for the researchers that in 2007, the former department, which is now the school, celebrated their 50th anniversary, but they've been teaching speech for more than 100 years at Purdue. Well, that's my favorite thing about Purdue. Yeah. That everybody that comes here has to go through speech 114 or a, a, a similar class. There are very few schools in the United States that require that. And I think and I've seen a number of business people who can't get up on their feet and talk. Uh, I, I think it's a tremendous asset. And, I agree. and we, um, I talk about it all the time because I think, I don't think, I don't think Purdue realizes how unique it is. I really I don't. think that's a great statistic. You know, I mean, a hundred years to say, I can't believe that. Right. You know. um, family? Married to my charming and lovely wife who is in this room uh, after uh, 63 years of being single. Uh, married a woman from 
Lafayette, even though she likes to point out she was born in North Carolina. She grew up in Lafayette from age five until she went off to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Her mother, who raised her two daughters in Lafayette, worked for the people that owned and operated the National Homes Corporation, which is no longer in existence, but she was there for over 25 years. And uh, we went to grade school together at St. Mary's Cathedral Grade School, even though we weren't dating when I was in the fifth grade and she was in the first, which have been a not a terribly smart thing to do. The nuns wouldn't have appreciated that. But uh, we've been married now close to eight years and um, having a great time. That's good. Do you have any siblings that are still uh, living? Or? Nobody is living in my immediate family. You did my, have some siblings, though. I did have a brother. He uh -huh. died about three or four years ago. And my parents died about 22 years ago. Uh, actually, they were two years apart for, for my parents dying. They both, my mother was born in Arkansas, my father born here, and grew up as a local business person, uh, was a wholesale beer distributor, owned a tavern with his father for a while. Sure. And my brother was in the commercial real estate business. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's talk a few about your awards. One of the ones was at National Press Club, the Fourth Estate Award. Uh, any comment on that? Well, the Fourth Estate Award, my memory is that they uh, always ask people to come in and give speeches. And one of my favorite people in the world, Richard Norton Smith, came in and made a total uh, sarcastic fun of me. And that is a kick because he is a great presidential historian. Okay. <laughs> and then you've also got in 2003 the Humanities Medal. Um, how about the Harry S. Truman Good Neighbor Award? It, that's kind of one I don't hear too much about. Well, it's given by the uh, Truman Library. Okay. And <clears throat> that's that kind of awards a kick because of the history involved in it. But I got to tell you, go back to the Humanities Award okay. in 2003, given by the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's given by the president. And here's the memory. Um, there's a whole bunch of us that got the award that year. I don't know. There's probably 11, 12 people. You get it in the uh, that year. We got it in the Oval Office. It's normally given out in a public ceremony in the East Room. Here's the reason. This was in end of February, I believe, in 2000. Be George Bush. Yes, Bush. George W. Bush. It was just a two weeks or so. It may have been early March, before the beginning of the Iraq War. And looking back on it, I mean, we're, the nation was quite tense at that point. They didn't want to show partying going on or wards during the time it was leading up to the war. So we did everything in the Oval Office, done quietly, didn't get much attention. And I just remember standing in that Oval Office watching the president, uh, and I was there for probably 45 minutes to an hour, uh, watching everybody else get their awards. And it was really interesting because of the, the tension that was involved. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, the Media Institute's Freedom of Speech Award. What Media Institute is a kind of a trade association for people in the corporate broadcasting world <clears throat> that it was nice to get the award but it doesn't it didn't have any particular uh, mm -hmm. unusual meaning to it well I think the presidential medal of freedom award who's a very good and also you are the you and Neil Armstrong are the only Purdue alums that have gotten that one yeah, that's unusual. Um, that's very not special. For, well, it's unusual for anybody in the media to get it. And I, I tell you, I don't know why I got it, uh, other than the fact that we're, we're totally nonpartisan at C-SPAN. And I don't think anybody, I don't think that the president was worried about giving it to somebody who was thought to be on one side or the other. I certainly am not on any of those, any side, his side or any the other side. And um, but I tell you what made it special, though. It's going to mm -hmm. sound odd, maybe. The person that was there sitting right next to me was Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. And she was, um, I think at the time, about 82 years old. But I'm sitting next to her, and I'm thinking, this is really odd, because she does not, she's never been interviewed. And she can't hear much anymore and at the time that he was presenting her award I had to lean over to her and whisper in her ear he's talking about you and then she wasn't you know she was in a wheelchair and when it came time the military aid was supposed to help her up and for some reason it didn't come up so I helped her up to uh, get her award that's my strongest memory from that with this exception when it came time for me to get the award my wife was sitting in the audience 
And I said to the president, is it okay if I invite her up here on the stage? And he said, sure, go ahead. So I looked over and she's sitting off to the side and I went like this, you know, and she looked at me as if to say, you're not doing this to me. <clears throat> but she very nicely came up to the stage and we had a nice picture yeah. taken and all that. Yeah. So that's what, you know, what really matters from uh, days like that. That makes it extra special. It does. There you go, okay. The um, lone sailor from the U.S. Navy's mem memorial in September of 2000, that's very special. Yeah, that's and another unique. one of those surprises because right. I was in the Navy for four years at the Pentagon in the Public Affairs Office the last two of those years. Have no idea where that came from. Uh, the lone sailor award is given to the Marines, the Coast Guard, and the Navy, and you can be enlisted or officer. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason to who gets it or why they get it. And the thing that made it fun for me was the, that night, uh, Vicki, my wife's two nephews are in the Navy now. They're both commanders. They've been in the Navy over 20 years. They were there with their wives at the same table. And so it was that kind of a night where you were able to kind of celebrate their service. Uh, and it was, it was fun, and I remember the evening became kind of long, and one of the recipients who will remain unnamed, who was a famous uh, actor, got up and gave, I think we timed it, a 22-minute speech when we were supposed to speak from three to five minutes near the end of the evening, and everybody was, you know, going crazy. Uh, and that's always one of the side things, because some people, when they get these awards, stand up and they say, this is your life, and they are ready to pronounce it. So my memories of things like that are pretty simple, and uh, it was an exciting, fun evening. I hear you. <laughs> I got one one time, and the person said, just get up and say thank you, and that's it, because the person before went on and on and on, so I know what you mean. Um, the, uh, you got an honorary doctorate from Purdue, and the College of Liberal Arts Distinguished Alumni Award. That's very nice. That was a kick. I remember yeah. a guy named Tom Moore who uh, had written a movie who was close to being in my class that was there that night. And it was fun meeting the rest of the group. Uh, you know, people you didn't know were coming in. There were several people that got the award that night. That was, uh, it's been a long time ago. Yeah, but that's kind Years of special. are moving on. Uh, hobbies and special interests? Any activities that you care to comment? Any particular hobbies you have? I, it's very. I'm very uh, easy to uh, uh, to explain on that matter. I I I'm, I listen to music all the time. Uh, I'm a big radio nut. I listen to the radio, uh, you know, often around the clock. Uh, I love reading newspapers, magazines, and books. And um, other than Friends, which is very important, the movies. Yeah. Even the rotten movies we go to. We go to lots of movies, sometimes three a weekend. That sounds good. We got a lot in common. I like the movies, too. I was raised in them sometimes. Um, in closing, our basically, I'm an information nut. This was a quote that I have. I look at C-SPAN and, and the next, oh, oh 10, 10 years in the 21st century. Any, I'll leave it up to you. I would like to share. With I, the I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've been a part of is the creation of uh, all the programming services on cable television. A lot of people say there's nothing on. I would highly disagree. Uh, there's a lot more there than people are willing to give it credit for. But more than anything else, what cable did was break the monopoly of the three commercial television networks. That's over. They will never have the monopoly that they had, and I think it's uh, much healthier for us as a people. What's happened though recently with the Twitter and Facebook and uh, email and smartphones and iPads and iPad minis and all that means that this society is communicating much differently today than it did when I was growing up. I don't know where C-SPAN fits 10 years from now. I have no idea. Uh, Even within five, it's hard to predict. It, it is right. because will there be, as long as there's a funding source, we'll be there. But a lot of the things that we do are being done by others because people do like to control their own environment. And so they're putting their own video on YouTube and the web <clears throat> and their websites. And so we have to be on our toes to survive as an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, I've now been doing this for uh, about total of about 35 years, uh, almost 36 years. 
And um, I don't know how long it lasts. I, that sounds a, like a negative, but the younger people are going to be responsible for keeping it going. Right. Good point. Okay. Anything I forgot to ask that you'd like to? Uh, Do you want me to talk about the years I was in prison or the time? No. Oh, uh, no, I didn't. I that, would. <laughs> that's a joke. I know, uh, I know. Uh, yeah, although, you Usually know, sometimes they'll say they'll remember. Well, you did forget to ask this, so I'm just leaving it up to you. Uh, I appreciate that. I think you're with these two different. How about um, a Purdue tradition? I think I may have asked that before, but uh, I might, have, might ask, it, ask it again. Um, should I talk about the lions? The tr yeah, anything. Sometimes people get befuddled <clears throat> with that. Um, and My favorite thing about Purdue, uh, other than, and I've named these folks before, my good professors that I can remember to this day, and the students that I went to school with that I'm still very close friends with, mm -hmm. and there are a whole bunch of them, uh, was the simple, I, I think the thing that I thought was fantastic at this school, especially because it's not a music school, is the marching band, the Purdue Hall of Music, the Purdue Glee Club, everything entertainment and, um, and performance here. It's, it's strange that a state school with an emphasis on agriculture and engineering. And no affiliation with a music school no, whatsoever. has been so tremendous right. in, in music. And at C-SPAN we now have two glorious human beings named Sarah and Shelley Zhu who were the silver twins here at Purdue. They work at C-SPAN, <clears throat> and it has really been fun because they are, we, the Silver Twins started when I was here. That whole, that whole uh, custom. We had, the, we had the Golden Girl right before I started at Purdue, and in 1962 they started the Silver Twins. So to have these two gorgeous young ladies, smart, capable uh, twins working for us, it has really been a kick. Yeah, I think so. Brian, I want to thank you and Vicki very much for the opportunity, and I really appreciate that. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Catherine.